Hey guys, it's Celestia, and following in the theme of my recent video about the biggest reasons your art isn't improving, today we're gonna talk about the biggest, most common mistakes artists make in their work, at least that I see. And in an effort to provide some kind of visual example of those mistakes, I drew wrong on purpose. More specifically, I drew the same piece twice, once with all or most of the mistakes I'll be discussing, and once without them, to hopefully explain more clearly how much of a difference correcting them can make in your work. So in today's video, as you can probably see, you'll be seeing two speed paints at once, one of each version. And then at the end, I'll go over a comparison of the two finished pieces and point out the specific mistakes in the first compared to the second. So you have to stick around to the end and give me better audience retention if you want to hear me dedicatedly roast myself. You have to. But before we get started with all of that, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Skillshare. I'm not gonna lie, my cold dead heart started beating with joy again for at least a full minute when they reached out to me, because I started my channel using Skillshare. This is literally the platform that helped me make YouTube into my career, so to be able to work with them and shout them out here is genuinely the dream. If you inexplicably don't know what Skillshare is in the year 2023, it's an online learning platform with courses on literally anything you could possibly want to learn. And in my opinion, as someone who spent the last two years using those courses for pretty much everything I needed to learn from my channel, it's the best platform out there to help anyone turn their creativity and passion into a career. Doing so often means needing to learn a million new skills you didn't expect to need, and it can be really overwhelming if you don't know where to start. Fortunately, Skillshare is where to start. You need to learn how to market your art? They have a course for that. You need to learn a new drawing software? They have a course for that. They literally have a course for anything. In terms of creative careers, they even have a Skillshare curated list of courses designed to help you grow yours, my favorite of which is Going Freelance, Building and Branding Your Own Success by Justin Ginek, which I would very much recommend to anyone trying to turn their creative passions into independent careers because it goes over everything from building a good portfolio to effectively marketing your work and everything in between. Others I've personally taken and found helpful are Adobe Premiere Pro Essentials Training Course by Daniel Scott, which taught me how to make my videos, and Character Illustration, Drawing Faces, Figures, and Clothing by Gabriel Piccolo, which helped me so, so much with making my poses less stiff, which is a problem I'll get into more later in the video. All of these will be linked in the description, so please go check them out if you're interested. Speaking of links in the description, the first thousand of you to click the first one there will be able to get a full month free trial of Skillshare, giving you access to not only the courses I mentioned already, but their entire library. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that in that month, you'll have resources and information to take your work to the next level, no matter what that looks like for you. So please go click that link and see for yourself. Yourself. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I really do mean it when I say that they're a dream sponsor for me, as someone who's been using their platform for such a long time now, and seeing just how much value it's had for my career. So seriously, go check them out. All of the gushing aside, let's get into the video. What are the most common mistakes that artists make in their work? That's right, I am once again asking for you to willingly choose to listen to me list a million reasons your art is bad. Obviously that's a joke. Even if you do make these mistakes, that doesn't mean your art sucks, and there are also some that come down to style and personal preference rather than objective fact. For example, I'll eventually go over shading with black as a mistake, but there are instances where that's a perfectly valid stylistic choice when done right. I will go over the nuances of these mistakes and what makes them mistakes when done wrong, but just be aware right off the bat that none of these mistakes are objectively factually bad. They're opinion-based rules of thumb that you are more than welcome to disagree with. I actually posted these two example pieces pieces on Patreon for early access and had someone comment that they liked both pieces for different reasons, which I found really interesting, because it says a lot about how much significance personal preference has when it comes to these mistakes. Anyway, I'll break the mistakes down into four main categories, which I'll go over in order. Anatomy, line art, color and composition, and rendering. And starting with anatomy, the most obvious mistake is just overall poor understanding and implementation of anatomy, resulting in inconsistent or inaccurate proportions. Let's go over a slideshow of my old art to see some examples, because God knows there's nothing I love more than roasting myself. This woman, for example, has a ridiculously long torso and probably a good five or so extra vertebrae. This man straight up has no pelvis. His torso is just connected directly to his legs. This sexy robot man's forearm is unacceptably long, and this 
I mean, there's a reason this one was in my video roasting my own art, and there are really just so many things wrong with it that I can never decide which one to even look at first. For the sake of this point, though, I'd like to bring your attention specifically to the arms rather than all of the other atrocities, because all of them are either completely lacking in joints, elbows, and shoulders, effectively making them fleshy noodles, or are just inexcusably long. This is a very common mistake amongst beginner artists who aren't super well-versed in anatomy yet, and is a prime example of the importance of learning the fundamentals before, or at least at the same time, as stylizing your work, because doing so is the best way to avoid it. You can absolutely exaggerate features and proportions to suit your style, but if you want your work to still look correct and not have any of the errors you just saw in that slideshow of my shame, you should know how those features and proportions look in reality so you can exaggerate them right. For example, I'm not saying this chibi is wrong because her head is too big. That's how heads are supposed to look in the chibi style. But I am saying that it's wrong because her torso is longer than the human centipede, and that is not a characteristic of the style, and it also wasn't intentional. I deliberately chose to make the head bigger because it's a chibi. I did not choose to make her torso the length of a major highway on purpose. I did it because of a lack of anatomical knowledge. The best way to avoid this mistake is to use more references, study anatomy more seriously, and make sure you're drawing the character's body before you draw their clothes. You should also make sure that you don't avoid problem areas in this regard. Like, a lot of artists struggle with hand anatomy, for example, and their solution is to just always hide hands, like I did with that chibi, and this piece, and also this piece. As you can see, it's a mistake I used to make a lot. I discussed this more in my recent video about why your art isn't improving, linked in the iCard above, but you can't improve your anatomy without practicing it, and hiding hands or feet or other problem areas for you isn't gonna do you any favors in the long run. The next common art mistake in the category of anatomy, just real quick, on the topic of hands, is that artists will draw fingers like they only have two joints past the knuckle. Fingers bend in three places, and while the last two joints often do bend together and look like one long part of the finger, that is most definitely not always the case, and fingers end up looking very stiff or unnatural if that third joint at the end isn't considered. This mistake is easily remedied by just looking at your own hand in the same position as the hand that you're drawing and using that as reference, particularly focusing on those joints. Next anatomy mistake, your poses are stiff, boring, or repetitive. Like I said earlier, this is something I personally struggle with even now, which that Skillshare course was very helpful with, so again, check that out if this is a mistake you're making too. But it's a mistake that results from a poor or limited understanding of the line of motion and the way that the human body naturally and comfortably moves. And it's most commonly exemplified by artists who only draw characters in the same front-facing simple pose over and over again, artists who never draw any dynamic action-based poses that may be more challenging, and artists who, when trying to draw those dynamic action-based poses, end up with a very stiff, unnatural-looking, almost robotic subject. This doesn't necessarily reflect a lack of anatomical knowledge or understanding, because it's not necessarily anatomically incorrect at all. People can, in real life, look stiff and uncomfortable and rigid, and art can subsequently be anatomically correct and also stiff and boring. Someone can stand robotically and someone else can power pose, and the one power posing will be more appealing to look at, artistically speaking, than the one standing robotically, but they're both still anatomically correct human beings. Someone standing stiffly reads as discomfort, and art depicting a character standing stiffly subsequently reads as wrong or unnatural. My point is that stiff poses in art aren't wrong, they're just not as appealing to look at as fluid dynamic poses. This mistake is most easily avoided by doing more gesture studies, making sure you're varying the poses that you draw characters in, and by standing in the position that you're drawing your subject in and seeing if you're comfortable. If you're uncomfortable, that means the human body wouldn't naturally and comfortably be in that position that way, so you should change the pose to reflect how you would comfortably be in that position. This mistake applies to expressions, too. Obviously, sometimes the subject you're drawing will just naturally and intentionally have a relatively neutral expression, but if you're drawing every single character with a completely neutral expression, this will lead to same face syndrome, another thing I struggle with greatly, and work that reflects vastly less personality in the character. If the subject you're drawing is smiling, it can be helpful to just even consider who they are and implement that. Like, are they shy? It might be a shyer smile with downturned eyebrows and more of a blush. Are they confident and smug? Well, then you got the, the more aggressive eyebrows, maybe more of a smirk than a smile. A smile will look different depending on the character's disposition, and considering that in your depiction of them will give your pieces more individuality and life. Anatomy aside, let's move on to the next category of art mistakes, line art. There are only two mistakes that I see super often 
in terms of line art, but they both have a very big impact on the overall quality of the affected art, so their significance shouldn't be underestimated. The first is that you're padding your lines. This means that you're drawing many small lines over each other rather than one long line, often a result of shaky hands, a lack of confidence, or rushing. Obviously, there's not a lot to be done about shaky hands, although as someone who has them, I've found it helpful to draw with more pressure and force throughout the lining process, take regular breaks, and utilize stabilization tools on digital art programs. But in terms of the other two, it's definitely something that dedicated practice can help. One long, confident line will look a lot smoother, cleaner, and less messy than a bunch of small overlapping lines, and it's more than worth it to put in the extra effort to achieve that. I did have one subscriber adamantly swear by padded lines, though, because they allowed them to stress less about line art and spend less time worrying about making sure their lines were perfect, and that's totally valid. I still think that cleaner lines do look better, but your personal comfort and priorities should be considered first and foremost. So if this is something that you're doing, I don't mean to say that you absolutely have to stop for your art to be good. It's just something to consider. The other big line art mistake I see all the time is when artists use the same line weight throughout the entire piece. What I mean is that an artist will draw a piece with a character and a background, and the line art will be completely flat and consistent throughout the entire thing. The character will be lined with the same line thickness as the background, and the big features and outlines will be done at the same line weight as the small details. There are obviously exceptions based on style, circumstance, and personal preference, but for the most part, line thickness should generally be varied. So things in the foreground, closer to the viewer, should have thicker lines, as should larger objects and forms, as well as areas where multiple lines intersect and are subject to more shadow. Things in the background should have much thinner lines, as should smaller details. This allows the viewer's eye to be drawn to the primary focuses, and is often a sorely overlooked aspect of line art, despite its importance. Varying your line thickness will help so much in making your art look more dynamic and compelling and giving it significantly more depth, and it's more than worth trying to be more conscious of in your work. Now, moving past line art mistakes, you might be wondering why I combined color and composition in terms of mistake categories. They don't sound like they would go together, but in terms of the mistakes I'll be discussing, they're actually very closely intertwined. And that's because color plays a huge role in composition. So I'll start with the mistakes that involve both and move on to the ones that really only pertain to one or the other. So mistake number one, the colors in your backgrounds are too close to the colors in your foregrounds. If your background is the exact same shade of green as the majority of what your character is wearing, your subject is going to blend right into the background, which will lead to a composition that draws focus only to the areas of your character that aren't green while making the rest of the character look detached and borderline invisible. You can fix this mistake by consciously and deliberately establishing a different, maybe less saturated background color palette from your foreground slash subject's color palette. And also by zooming out super far on your piece at the flat color stage and then squinting. If any aspect of the foreground or subject blends too much into the background based on color from that perspective, you'll know that your composition is being negatively impacted by your use of color and you'll be able to adjust it accordingly. Conversely, the opposite is also a mistake I see a lot of. The character you're drawing is colored in a way that appears completely detached from their setting or background. Here's a piece I drew in 2011 that exemplifies that pretty clearly. The setting is clearly dark with an obvious focus on it being nighttime, but the character is colored as if it's the middle of the day, which makes her seem completely disconnected from her setting. It can be tempting to make the character's palette very, very separate from the background to make them stand out from it, but if you make it too different, it'll seem unnatural and unrealistic. It's a delicate balance, like a lot of things in art, but it's one that's worth perfecting or at least practicing. The subject should, compositionally, stand out from its background because of its placement and hue, not saturation and brightness. What I mean is that if your color palette is subdued, earthy tones, the way to make your subject stand out from their background isn't to use neon or black and white colors, it's to contrast them compositionally. Make sure that if your character is wearing black jeans, their legs aren't shown over a black background. Make sure that if your character is wearing a pink shirt, their torso isn't depicted over a pink background. A color over another very similar color is only separated by your comparatively tiny line art, so compositionally speaking, it will make the piece seem very muddled and hard to read. Including similar colors in your background and foreground is very important when it comes to making sure your character or subject doesn't feel disconnected from their setting. But making sure those colors are different enough from each other in terms of physical placement is just as important. The eye, when reading an image's contents, relies heavily on color and contrast to distinguish one object from the other, and a huge mistake that artists often make is failing to consider that. That aside, the last mistakes in this category are pretty much just composition and not color, but they're still just as relevant, and the first of which is tangents. Tech 
Technically, the word tangent just means two things that are touching, but in art, it's a little more complicated than that, because the way two things touch has to be visually appealing, and a common mistake is that it's not. There are a multitude of ways that this can happen, and I won't touch on all of them now, so I would recommend looking into it in more depth yourself. But the bottom line is that compositionally, there are a lot of things to consider when multiple objects are interacting with each other. The most common examples I can think of in art are as follows. First, that two parallel lines are lined up. As you can see in this image, for clearer reference, the base of the subject's top hat lines up perfectly with the horizon line, making the two blend into each other. This results in the viewer being less able to distinguish between the two, diminishing the piece's compositional integrity. The easiest solution to this mistake is to just make sure that no significant parallel lines match up with each other. But that's not the only way tangents can negatively impact your art, which brings me to the next mistake, that your lines are unnaturally cleanly matching up with each other. Here are two still life sketches of fruit. In one, all of the edges of the fruits are touching, but at their exact edges. In the other, they're all overlapping. In the version where they're all just touching, it creates the subtle illusion that they're all almost subtly fused together, which is an unnatural and unappealing visual effect, because that doesn't naturally occur often, and subsequently unsettles the viewer and strikes them as wrong. It's much easier on the eye to separate objects via overlap, distinguishing them from each other. Again, there are more ways that tangents can negatively impact art, but they're much less commonly seen, and I only have so much time and you only have so much attention to give this video, so I encourage you to research them yourself. The next compositional mistake I see a lot of artists make is that they just generally don't consider composition at all in the placement of their subject. And once again, let me give you an example from my folder of old art that I've made. Look at this phoenix woman. She is so strong, so powerful. She could step on you. She could step on me, and yet she can't even get your full attention because she is weirdly placed in a way that doesn't account for negative space or the rule of thirds. There is way too much space at the bottom, she feels oddly off at the top corner, and you look at this piece and wonder, where is my eye supposed to be drawn to? The girl with bird arms, or the full half of the goddamn piece? That's sky. Like, you'd expect the fact that this is a woman with wings instead of arms to be pretty visually compelling, but because she's not actually the visual focus, it's not. At least not as much as it could be. The rule of thirds tells artists to divide their canvas into nine equal sections, and suggests that since the eye will be drawn to the areas where the lines of those sections intersect, you should place the parts of the piece that you want to emphasize there. A hugely common mistake is failing to consider this in your composition and leaving way too much negative space in one corner or another like I did with this phoenix woman. And it can be remedied by even just overlaying a divided grid of thirds over your piece during the sketch phase, when you can still easily edit that sketch to accommodate that. Finally, the last compositional mistake I see a lot of in art is very similar to the stiff and boring poses one over in anatomy, and it's that artists will only draw straight on symmetrically from one perspective. Most often, that means drawing the subject from a front-facing, head-on view with a middle horizon line. For anyone who doesn't know, the horizon line, also known as the eye line, is basically where the sky meets land. It's where the sun part of a sunset meets the land part of a sunset, or where the wall of your living room meets the floor of your living room. Always having that line be in the middle of your piece tends to create a very passport photo-esque vibe. It often feels staged, posed, and unnatural because that's not how we as viewers usually perceive the world around us. We don't often look at a person with a middle horizon point behind them. We don't often see a person at exactly the middle point of their background. We look at their face because their face is usually relatively level to our own, unless we're really, really short or tall. It, regardless, that is subsequently our focus, and art is no different. And when we do see them at a middle horizon point level, it's usually staged and intentional, like a passport photo or a mugshot. And not only does using a middle horizon line contribute to a more unnatural, stiff feeling, it also comes across as less compelling, because again, dynamic values matter. Our eyes are more drawn to a character's face if their face is larger because they're being seen from a more bird's eye view where it's more prominent, and the frills of their dress are prettier and more eye-catching if they're viewed from below, where those frills are the focus and not the character themselves. The angle at which a character is depicted should be considered when deciding on the piece's composition, and a huge problem I see in beginner artists is that they want to draw attention to one aspect, like the face or the clothing, but then they depict the subject as if they're being viewed from a mirror or a straight-on photo, rather than using angle to design the piece's composition to focus on it. It's not always a problem, depending on how you actually want the piece to appear, but for the most part, it doesn't attract viewer attention or capture the eye, at least not as much as it could have with a more carefully considered composition. Finally, the last category of mistakes, rendering. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the first mistake I'll be discussing is shading with black, as well as highlighting with white. And just like I said 
then, I do fully understand that this is sometimes an intentional stylistic choice that's done to achieve a more dramatic effect, like in comics and manga. I don't mean to diminish the value of that or call it a mistake. It's very much a case-by-case -case kind of thing and is similar to the whole proportion thing we went over earlier. If you do it on purpose to achieve an effect, that's totally fine, just like making a chibi head too big intentionally. But if you do it because you don't know that that's not what Shadow actually looks like or an effective, compelling creation of depth in your piece, it's probably gonna be more of a hindrance than anything. Shading with 100% black and highlighting with 100% white will achieve a dramatic effect, yes, but that's not actually what I'm talking about here. What I mean is that shading and highlighting with shades of black and white is generally ineffective. Using a darker or lighter shade of the exact same color as the thing that you're shading or highlighting is almost never gonna create nearly as much depth as using a different color altogether, because that creates a much more appealing, compelling contrast. The next common rendering mistake is that you're underblending or overblending in your shading and highlighting. So basically, you're using a large, soft airbrush tool for all of your shading and highlights, or you're using a completely hard-edged brush for all of your shading and highlights. Here are two versions of the quote-unquote wrong version of today's speed paint on opposite ends of that spectrum for a clearer visual reference of what I mean. You might look at these examples and think that some parts look better on one than the other, and that's because that's true. Realistic lighting isn't all hard or soft, but rather a combination of both. So certain areas of each version are effectively more correct than the other. But if one type of shading is used throughout the entire piece, rather than a combination of both with consideration for how light interacts with the human form, it won't look as good as it could. Obviously, there are exceptions to this in the cases of more dramatic, extreme art styles like comics and anime where cell shading is king, but for the most part, it's at least worth considering varying your shading and highlighting method based on how the light source would actually interact with the subject. And finally, the last rendering mistake I see a lot of is the overuse or lazy use of textures. So, for example, a character is wearing a gingham sweater. The mistake here would be to just slap on that texture and call it a day, because that's not at all how that pattern would actually look on a sweater. A sweater laid flat on the ground, maybe, but definitely not on a human body. The texture could absolutely be used on that sweater, but it should be edited and refined to match the shape of the fabric. The same goes for all textures on all subjects, because there are almost no circumstances where the object you're applying a texture to is completely flat or from a completely flat perspective. Even floors, like say you're drawing a wooden floor, so you use a wood texture, you're still probably going to be viewing that floor from a non-bird's eye perspective, which means that the wood planks would appear progressively smaller as they approach the horizon point, and the texture that you use should be edited and distorted to reflect that. And that finally brings us to the end of the mistakes. Now let's look at the art. This was actually a really difficult exercise for me to essentially try to draw wrong on purpose but still give the wrong piece a chance at being right, I guess. Like, I didn't want to be one of those YouTubers who was like, here's two pieces, one is wrong and one is right, and then the one that's right looks like a fully rendered masterpiece, while the one that's wrong is a sloppy sketch that looks like someone's one-year-old child drew it. I wanted to give the wrong version a chance at being the best version of what it is within the confines of incorrect art techniques, so that I could give you guys a clearer visual of what some of these mistakes might look like in an actual art piece and not a one-year-old sketch. I still feel like I could have done a better job of it, but it's hard, man. So it is what it is. I did my best. So now let's go over everything that's wrong with the piece on the left compared to the piece on the right. First, the anatomy mistakes. The arms are way too long compared to the torso. The pose is boring and lifeless. The expression is a neutral smile with no personality. And the subject, which is actually me in real life because I wanted to do an art versus artist thing and I thought this would be a good opportunity to, is drawn completely and unnaturally symmetrically. And then we've got the line art, which has the exact same line weight throughout the entire piece, including the background, with no variance to account for areas of shadow or proximity, and is full of petted lines. Next is color and composition, and I think the wrong piece actually does a great job of showing some of the most common mistakes in that category. First, the tangents. One of them isn't as clear with the white outline as it is without it, but I'll show you a version without it to make it more obvious. The vaporwave poster's lines exactly meet the line of my shoulder, making it appear as if the two objects are touching rather than one being in the foreground and one being in the background. Additionally, we have an example of the top hat ground man in the background, with the edge of the sunset picture being lined up exactly with the floor and subsequently appearing to be fused to it. Finally, we got that sweet, unnatural looking middle horizon line, and the fact that the blue of my shirt matches exactly with the blue of the floor, which makes my body blend right into it. Again, this is clear without the white outline, which a lot of artists use as a way to make these mistakes less obvious rather than fixing them. Definitely not calling myself out there. And then there's the fact that every single thing with pink on it is on one side of the piece, creating an unbalanced color composition. And in terms of rendering,
rendering, I shaded using exclusively black with half opacity, highlighted exclusively with white on half opacity, did not use a consistent or well-established light source, and slapped a denim texture on the jeans without considering the folds of the fabric, and then slapped a wood texture on the floor without considering the perspective, and the fact that the planks would appear progressively smaller as they approached the horizon line. In the second piece, I attempted to fix all of these mistakes, which I hope created a more compelling, visually appealing piece. That said, again, this exercise was incredibly difficult, so I'm sure you guys have some differing thoughts on how successful I actually was at drawing right and wrong through these pieces. So please let me know in the comments, because I'm genuinely really fascinated by the different perspectives surrounding this. And there we have it, the most common art mistakes I've seen artists make, and a vague attempt at exemplifying them for you all. I hope this video was at least somewhat helpful, and please let me know in the comments what you all think about it, because I know there are gonna be a lot of people disagreeing with my opinions here, and I'm legitimately so curious as to why and what their personal experiences and preferences are that differ from my own. Thank you for watching, and special thank you as always to channel members Cafe Soleil, Joseph Solomon, and Lotus Dreams Art, as well as patrons Batman, Kyle Lowe, Blue Swanson, Unity, Cora Fear, Jamisha Walker, Alang Shi, Soul Crystal, Kim Yen, Shabil Shi, Crazy Hisar, Gen Tong, Jacobus Peterson, Grayson Xavier, Ty Finch 94, Milk Bean, Eeyore Hee Haw, and MG for their support. I hope you enjoyed today's video, and I'll see you in the next one.